Good evening, everyone. Beruchim Abayim B'Shem Hashem. As always, it's great to see everyone. Even you, look, it's great to see you too. And before we begin today to discuss Parashat B'Shalach, which has an incredible and powerful and profound ideas that I think can contribute a tremendous to our life, I want to share with you a quick anecdote that just happened to me this past Shabbat that probably has nothing to do with the parasha, has nothing to do with the topic we're going to discuss, but I want to share it because I think there is a great value in it. You ready, Josh? You're listening? Great. I want to make sure you're here. So... This Shabbat, this past Shabbat, I was invited to a Shabbaton as a guest speaker in Vegas. And I was there on Friday night, I have Shabbat, you know, during the meal, during the Saudat Shabbat. And when I got up to speak, the rabbi's daughter, Rabbi Shemuel Atal, He's a great friend of mine. He's the rabbi of Merkaz Bet Yosef in Vegas. It's a great, great community. Beautiful community. We had an amazing, amazing experience there. When I got up to speak, the daughter who was, who is four years old, listen to this, four years old, she came to her sister, and she pointed at me and she said, who is this one? And his older daughter said, he's a rabbi. The daughter's name was Sheva, Bat Sheva, four years old. She told her sister, who is this one? And the older sister said, he's a rabbi. And the little, this little four years old said, there is no way he's a rabbi. It cannot be he's a rabbi. Because our father is a rabbi. So if our father is the rabbi, he cannot be the rabbi. So the sister said, no, our father is a rabbi and he is another rabbi. She said, two rabbis? Yeah, two rabbis. That is a rabbi, and he's another rabbi. Okay, good. Then in the middle of the, as I started to speak, I mentioned that that Shabbat was the memorial day, the Azkara, the Hilula of Baba Sali, a great rabbi in Eretz Israel who just passed away many years ago. And she said to her sister, and who is Baba Sali? Oh, she said, Baba Sali is a rabbi. She said, oh, this rabbi's name is Baba Sali? She said, no, 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 no. Baba Sali is another rabbi. So, dad is a rabbi, he is a rabbi, and Baba Sali is another rabbi. So she said, three rabbis? Yeah, three rabbis, good. I spoke for, I don't know, 45 minutes, an hour, something like that. And in the end of my lecture, she came again, this four years old girl, came to her sister, her older sister, and she said, Chaya, her name is Chaya, she said, Chaya, you lied to me. He's not a rabbi. She pointed at me and she said, he's not a rabbi. And she said, why not? She said, because in his speech, he used the word stupid. And rabbis don't say the word stupid. It's not nice. So when they told me the story, what hit me the most, aside from Beli Ainara, how clever she was, and at least I know one person at least listened to my conversation there, a four year old definitely listened to it. But aside from that, what hit me badly and I started to pay a lot of attention to, is something we always know, but it needs to be a reminder all the time to us. Quite often, we tend to say things to kids. 
And we think they're just four years old, they're just five years old, they're just kids. You say a bad word or you say any word, especially derogatory word, we fail to understand that people do listen. Little kids do listen. Little kids do understand. Little kids do inhale. Little kids do be affected by words we use. And they are very sensitive. The biggest mistake we make in life with little kids is when we fail to understand that negative and derogatory words can make a permanent impact on kids. And even if we don't think they have the capacity to listen, to understand, to inhale, to digest, they do. Point number two, it is a source of encouragement also for us to know that if we use constantly positive, encouraging, great words to kids, we can really build them up in such a great and profound way that sometimes we underestimate, we're a little stingy to use empowerment or great words. You know, what's the point? I mean, they know I love him. My child, they, she knows I love her. He knows I love him. It's not enough. Use it because you are injecting and inserting to their minds and their hearts the power of words that we sometimes underestimate or fail to understand the effect of it. So that was Vegas and I think uh, I felt this is an important message that I learned and I am happy to share. Very happy to share. And now we're going to talk about the parasha that we are going to read by Zrat Hashem this Shabbat and we all know Parashat Beshalah is the parasha we're going to read and this Shabbat has a new name to it and a special name to it that we acknowledge this Shabbat and we welcome this Shabbat with a holy powerful name called Shabbat Shira. Shabbat Shira is the Shabbat of the song, Shabbat of Am Israel praising Akadosh Baruch Hu in the time of Kriyat Yam Suf. But before we go to the actual event of Kriyat Yam Suf, I want to start with um, a statement, a statement that I believe can be used and should be very appropriately used as a foundation to our conversation today. I think it's true to say that there are what we call and natural behaviors of people that in order for people to behave in those natural domains, people do not need motivation, encouragement, if the kind of behavior is natural. I don't believe there is any human being on the planet Earth, I'm using a physical pleasure and a physical natural need. I don't think anybody needs a special motivation to eat. We don't need to encourage people. We don't need to remind people every single day. Come on, look, you got to think, you got to eat, you got to eat. You know, when you eat, you know what? If you love me, encourage me to stop eating. Yes or no? Fair enough or no? If you, if you really love me, encourage me to stop eating. Don't encourage me to eat because naturally I'll eat. Naturally I'll drink. I don't know anybody who needs lessons or university or a long day of learning or training that it is very important to go to sleep. You're tired, you go to sleep. It's pretty natural. It's pretty natural. And if we see that there is any, any area in our lives that requires a constant reminder and all kinds of motivation skills and tricks that people use to encourage us, to, to push us to get into, it's probably because naturally we're not going to get there. Probably naturally we will neglect that, naturally we will forget about it, naturally we will resist it. So you need a constant reminder and empowerment words and motivation tricks to get us into achieving these goals. Fair enough. 
And, and we, can, we can use so many example for, examples for that. We can teach people that when you make money and you have a parnasa, it's not you that made the money. It's God that provided the money to you through the kind of work you do. But it's not really you. Why do we need this constant reminder to always pay attention to the source of our money as God, as a Kadosh Baruch The reason why is because naturally when a person works hard and he makes a lot of money, he feels, I made the money. And you know why I made the money? Because I am simply a clever and brilliant businessman. Not only that, I work hard. So naturally, we tend to take credit to the success of any kind that we have to ourselves. Because on the surface level, it might appear to be like that, that I worked hard and I worked smart and I worked right and I made it. See, I had the right product. I sold it to the right people. I used the right social, mo- social media marketing. I did everything according to the book and I succeeded. Conclusion, I'm great. This person needs a consistent reminder that it's not you. It's not you. It's through you, but it's not you. You're not the creditor of this success. And it's true in many other domains. You encourage people to be consistent. You encourage people to be disciplined. It's because naturally we need this encouragement. Because naturally, you know, we go with the flow, whatever we feel. I love that. We say, you know, I need to do I don't feel like it. We are worshipping feelings. We're worshipping the way we feel. And I don't feel like it today. You know, we are mood swings people versus people who are disciplinary and people who are in commitment and people who are consistent in what they do and they determine in, in achieving their goals. Those kind of concepts, we are being encouraged constantly because naturally we don't have it. So having that in mind... Since Parashat B'Shalah we are going to learn today is speaking about the greatest miracle ever happened to Am Israel when Am Israel, when the Jewish people left Egypt and they got into the Red Sea, the Yam Suf, and they got themselves in the position where the Egyptians were behind them, chasing them, and in front of them is the ocean, is the water. So they found themselves in the middle, Egyptians behind them, the water in front of them, and they had no idea what to do. They cannot go back, they cannot move forward. And at this point, Akadosh Baruch Hu created a miracle for them that the Red Sea split it to 12 different lanes. Kirat Yamsuf. When that happened, we know that Am Israel, the Jewish people, started to give a tremendous gratitude song. Shira, Shira is a song. Am Israel started to sing a song to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Az Yashir Moshe uvenei Israel et ha-shira azot l'Hashem. So Am Israel, alongside with Moshe Rabbeinu, alav ha-shalom, started to sing a song of gratitude to a Kadosh Baruch. Fine. So my question is like this. Is saying Shira, is praising God for such a miracle, is it a natural kind of behavior? Would you say this is natural and expected kind of a behavior? You are stuck. I saved you. Be a normal human being and say, thank you. Yeah, sing a song. Praise me. I did it for you. You were stuck in the middle of the ocean. And I opened the ocean for you. 
would we say that saying the song or singing the song, the shira, the praising, the halal to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it's a normal thing. And if Am Israel wouldn't do it, we would call that something is wrong with you. Or maybe it's not true. Maybe the human natural behavior is not to sing, is not to praise. It's not to think. It's not to thank Akadosh Baruch Hu for it. And if they do, it's a big deal. Like you did something miraculously important, like out of the ordinary. This is not a normal thing. I would say, I would say that it appears to be from the way the Torah emphasized that and from the way that our hachamim are emphasizing the idea of the shira, it seems like we are paying a very, very close attention to the fact that the Jewish people said the shira. They praised the Kadosh Baruch Hu. And you might ask, praise the Kadosh Baruch Hu, what's the big deal? It's normal. It's a very, very normal and expected behavior to be in that position and experience that experience, get out of this experience and praise HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What's the big deal? What is the big deal that we are making out of the Shira? Especially that it appears to be a pretty natural thing to do. However, we spoke about two possibilities. A person went through a miracle, a person were, was in trouble, got out of the trouble, should he say shira, shouldn't he say shira? We can debate that for a long time. We can dig into this and to investigate intellectually if this is a normal, a natural human behavior or it is not, or it's a big deal. But there's one thing we can definitely agree upon. I think it's pretty easy for us to agree that if a person is not only not praising, but if a person can even complain about the one who made the miracle for them. If we see a person that gets a miracle after miracle, help after help, support after support, and the only thing he has to say towards me is a negative and derogatory words and constantly complain, I think that is a completely different level of humanity. You would ask yourself, is there anything wrong with you? Like for real. And as we see the parasha, parashat b'shalach, the Torah said, Vayi b'shalach paro et ha'am, ולא נחם אלוהים דרך ארץ פלישתים, כי קרוב הוא, כי אמר אלוהים פלנחם העם, בראותם מלחמה ושבו מצרים. Anybody who reads those words will have to be disturbed, but deeply disturbed. הקדוש ברוך הוא, with and through משה רבנו and אהרון הכהן, are going to the Egyptians with plague after plague, maka hare maka. HaKadosh Baruch Hu giving Paro, Dam, Sephardea, Kini, Ma'aro, the whole educational process. And Am Israel sees that to the extent that in Makat Bechorot it reached the point that Paro couldn't take it anymore and Paro simply said to Am Israel, please get out of here and as fast as possible. And Am Israel realized that the one who actually took them out of Egypt is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is God. And in the parasha that we are reading about this redemption, this freedom out of Egypt, the words are very, very disturbing. Apparently, the Torah said, "Vayi b'shalach paro et ha'am." So, who sent the nation out? Who sent Am Israel out? 
Paro. Paro sent them, huh? After God is deeply moving the entire game and getting them out of Egypt, now you're thanking Paro. You give the credit of us being out of Egypt to Paro. It's like I'm sending you a $5,000 gift. $5,000 gift. And you get it through a UPS driver. And you make a whole party for this gift and you're thanking the UPS driver. The UPS driver. Wow. Such a great guy. He gave me the box with the $5,000 it. Hello? The UPS driver is... The messenger. It's a great guy. Make no mistakes. I love them. <laughs> love them. No problem. But you forgot who is really behind it? You forgot who really gave you the $5,000? It's the driver? Paro sent us out? Not God? So it's apparently more than just Praising Akadosh Baruch Hu. It's more than just saying Shira or not saying Shira. It gets even further than that. That there is apparently a very deep lack of appreciation and realization of what the reality is. Who actually took you out. And it goes further than that. When you look at the parasha and you see that Am Israel got stuck Right in front of Yam Suf, Am Israel were screaming, which is fine. Am Israel are crying and praying. Fine, that's that's normal. That's what you do when you need help. But then you see, there are not enough graves. In Egypt, that you took us out to the desert to kill us here? Why did you take us out of Egypt? This is what we told you when we were in Egypt. Stop, leave us alone, let us keep working. It is better for us to die in Egypt than work in Egypt, serve in Egypt, than dying in the desert. And we see that Akadosh Baruch Hu replied to their need with a huge and incredible miracle, a profound miracle of Kiryat Yamsuf. And when Kiryat Yamsuf happened, Am Israel said Shira, Az Yashir Israel, Am Israel, the complainers, those who are lacking appreciation and gratitude, all of a sudden they are singing. That's an incredible change from a complainer to a singer that's a great change right and the question is what happened in Yetziat Mitzrayim what happened in Kirat Yamsuf that made Am Israel to sing the second question that I have to be extremely, extremely careful for before I ask is uh, has to do with one of the most powerful movements we have in our generation called feminism. Feminism, and I'm not going to talk about feminism right now. This is not, uh, this is not our topic. It's a very sensitive topic. Very, very sensitive topic. But we all know, we all are aware of the fact that there are many, many people, many people in this world that are questioning why men do this, why women do that, why women cannot do this. In, in halakha and outside of halakha, in any area in life, can a woman do everything men do? Are we equal or not equal? I'm not going to go into this right now. But one thing I can tell you, the feminism movement is not doing a favor to the woman. By 
forcing them to show some masculine force, masculine power. They're not doing a favor, they're not serving them, but this is not the topic for now. But the reason why I am reminded of feminism, it's because in the Torah, in the entire Torah, this is the only event that we see what we call apparently feminism 101. Feminism 101. Apparently. We know that when Am Israel crossed Yam Suf, they sang. אז ישיר משה ובני ישראל את השירה הזאת למונה, ויאמרו למור, השירה להשם כי גאו גאה, סוס ורוכבו רמה וים, עם ישראל praised God for what happened to them. Great, beautiful. All of a sudden, we see surprisingly, when עם ישראל completed the song, completed praising בורא העולם, we see the Pesukim in the Torah, Vatikah Miriam Anevi'ah, Achot Aaron et Atof Beyada, Vatetzena Kol Anashim Achareya Betupim O Bimcholot. Vatan Lahem Miriam, Shiru Lashem Ki Gao Ga'a, Sus Verochevo Rabba Vayam. ותיקח מרים הנביאה. מרים, משה אין אהרון סיסטר, מרים הצדקת, מרים הקדושה, מרים הנביאה, אחות אהרון. She is אחות אהרון. Who is missing here? משה. אחות אהרון, where is משה here? Why doesn't say, Ahot Aharon, Hu Moshe? Anyways, Ahot Aharon et atov beyada, and she gathered all the women, but the tzena kol anashim ahareya betupim ubecholo, they all comes out with drums and, and, dancer, and dancing. And what is she saying? What are the words she's singing? The Torah said, Vata'an lahem Miriam. Miriam responded to them. She responded to what question? Who asked her any question? If you pay close attention, she is singing the same exact words the man sang. She is not creating anything new. She is not inventing anything new. All we know is, that Miriam and Nevi'a, she is the sister of Aharon, gathered the woman with drums and dancing, and she replied to them. She answered to whom? The men. So if we pay attention, it seems like there was some kind of a dialogue. There was some kind of a conversation between Az Yashir Moshe of Bnei Israel when the men sang. And vata'an lahem Miriam, she replied to them, she answered to them, she looked back to them and she said the same exact word. Shiru l'Hashem ki ga'o ga'a, sus v'orhevo, rama v'yam. Bidiuk, exactly, one to one, exactly the same words that the man said. So Miriam, what's the idea of gathering the woman and saying it? And Miriam, why you are only a hot Aharon? And Miriam, what are you answering? What was the question to begin with? And Miriam, what are you inventing by saying the exact same words a man said two and a half seconds ago? What are you saying? Miriam, what are you saying? What is the Hiddush? What is the Hiddush and what you are saying versus what Am Israel said two seconds ago? To understand this concept of shira, to understand why it's so difficult to say shira to praise. To understand what Miriam did and what's the difference between Am Israel and the woman. I would like to share an understanding, a tovana, a point of view 
about Shira with a clear differentiation from Shira to Halel, where is Shira is the song and Halel is praising. We tend to believe, and this is what usual reaction of people, when they think, and this is their usual understanding of people when they talk about shira praising. Most people in the world believe that you praise someone when this person did something for you. I'm praising you in a sense of me, of, of me expressing gratitude. You are such a great man to me. You did such a big favor. So do you, Josh. You also do. So in a way, I'm praising you. I'm praising you for what? For you being what? Well, for you being kind to me. For you doing something for me. So the greater the favor the greater the praising, if so, no. You're not going to get the same kind of song, the same kind of expression of gratitude if you give me a buck or if you give me a million dollars. Nothing can help you. There is a big difference. If you give me a dollar, I'm willing to go that far to say thank you. If you give me $10,000, I'm going to write a song for you. If you give me a million dollars, I'm going to sing and I'm going to dance for you. Out on the street, like crazy. The greater the favor you did for me, the greater the gratitude, the appreciation, the praising song I will do for you. Yes or no? Make sense? But if we pay attention, we should know that praising you for what you did for me is a very, very, very basic, fundamental, low level of gratitude. Because if we pay attention, a close attention, just think about it for a second. If I praise you for something you did for me, who do I really love and who is truly happy? I got something from you. I'm praising you. I'll call it for the sake of the conversation. I'm praising you for a selfish benefit. You gave me something. You've been nice to me. And I'm praising you for that. But I'm praising you for being a messenger because I got a benefit. I enjoyed it. Praising someone for, we say it a lot when we want to think about God, we think about HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we tell people, if you feel some challenges in life, excuse me, the great advice we give to people is count your blessings. Which is a big deal. Which is a big deal. There are a lot of people in this world that are focusing their entire life on what they're missing versus what they're having. Sometimes you can hear people using words. Oh, I'm suffering alive. Suffering. Life is tough. Life is painful. I tell people, hey, be careful. Be careful when you use those words. Do not speak about suffering. You don't even have a clue what suffering look like. Watch your words. Watch your choice of words. I'm suffering. I'm living in LA in a million dollars house and I have work and I drive a car and I have clothing and I have food and I'm so blessed, but I'm suffering. We shall never know from suffering. We shall never know what the word suffering means. But that much we know. If you focus your entire life on what's missing, 
you might come out with some words that will create other people to get out the violin and sing and cry with you, with two boxes of tissue. Because you're suffering. Life is so hard. Life is so painful. Watch your words. When we get something from someone, we praise them. Which is an important thing to do. Very important thing to do. Count your blessing. Praise Akadosh Baruch Hu for your blessings. Praise people that do something good for you. It's all holy and great. Make no mistake. But there is a higher level of song. There is a higher level of praising. There is a higher level of expressing a song to someone. And I call it, praising comes from the heart, a song comes from the mind. This is a point in life when we understand something, the greatness of someone, regardless of any benefit I get from you. In other words, this is a very high level of life. It's a very high skill to have. But if we can have it, life is a dream. There are many, many people, there are many people that when they think about HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, they are associating the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in relation to what they have from Him. I love Hashem. I love God. Why? He gives me life. True. Why do you love HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Why do you appreciate HaKadosh Baruch Hu for? Because He gives me health. He gives me food. He gives me whatever. Anything that I have is from Him. So I love you and I appreciate you and I see your greatness through the things that I have from you. But there is a much, much higher level of seeing the greatness of God. Seeing the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that has to do with our ability to stop and think and pay close attention to the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the greatness of God, not for what He does, but really for who He is. If we pay attention on the way apples come into the world, even if you hate apples, which I do, even if you really don't like it, you have no good relationship with apples. But you look at the apple, did you ever see how an apple grows? Did you ever see it? It's unbelievable. Did you ever see a seed of a tree? We pay attention, if we pay attention, we look at a seed of a tree. Do you know what there is in this seed? Do you know what's, what there is inside it? There are apples. There are roots of the tree. There are branches. Here, do you see them? You don't see them, right? But do you think they're there? They are. Who in the world put them there? Who in the world put the red juicy apples and the leaves and the branches and the trunk and the roots here? Where is that for who put this there? If people stop, stop life and start thinking, they can see God. 
they can see Bore Olam, they can see a Kadosh Baruch Hu in every single element in the creation in this world. Seeing a Kadosh Baruch Hu, seeing God in a sense of awe. Oh, Wow. Just saying wow. Just paying attention to every single thing. I mean, if a person would ever pay attention to the human body, how a human body is being created, how a human body is functioning, I would never forget, never in my life. When I was with my wife once in an ultrasound when she was pregnant, did you ever see a heartbeat in your life? A heartbeat of a heart in a, in a baby's body? It's, it's a mind-boggling. It's beyond imagination. I've been looking at the screen on the ultrasound. And the heartbeat, you know how the heartbeat looks like? The heartbeat is a little tongue, just like this. And every single one of us. It's a little tongue. That goes like this. Just like that. Do you know what happens if it stops? Do you know what happens if it stops? If you take a break for a minute, what happens to a person? It's gone. It's dead. And last time I checked, there is no battery connected to it. And there is no plug into any power, any force. Who is moving this? Every single second. And I can talk about a human body forever. Paying attention to this is telling us that there are two separate levels of gratitude, of singing. There is a moment of singing because of what you did for me. This is the song that comes from the heart. Of appreciation. You did something good for me and I appreciate you. God, you give me life and I appreciate it. God, you give me health and I appreciate it. God, you give me this and I appreciate it. That's pretty natural. But there is a higher level of awe, of honor, of wonder, of singing. Is when the moment occurs to us, as we call it. Aha. Uh -huh. mm. God, now I get you. Look at this. I mean, you can see it in ten and a half billion items in the world. You take a little bird that you see that has a purple color in the top, and there is a green in the bottom, and there are two lines of white and two sides. And you ask yourself, who took this and painted it? And every bird from that type is the same. You can go nuts paying attention. Think about a human body, a human face. Look at a human face for a second. I'm saying it, I'm speaking about this because it's really, really. Something I believe we have to stop life and start thinking about. How many people are in the world today? What's the number today? Look, 8.4? I don't know the exact number. Last time I didn't count them all. But the numbers in, in Google is about 8.4 billion people. I don't know if we can comprehend the number, 8.5 billion people. But one thing we know, 8.5 billion people have the same exact features on their face. They have a nose, they have a mouth, they have teeth, they have ears, they have eyes, they have everything you and I have. Eight and a half billion! Yet none of them looks like the other one. None of them looks like the other one. We have the same features. All of us. Different. Eight and a half billion people have a different fingerprint. Go figure. Who is in charge of that? 
you can see God every single place in every single minute of our lives with one condition, that we pay attention to. When Am Israel left Egypt, Am Israel were slaves. When Am Israel left Eretz Mitzrayim, they left slaves. And what made Am Israel slaves? The Egyptians. What did they do to make them slaves? And what is the definition of a slave? A slave, listen to this, it's really powerful. A slave is a person that has an outside force that controls every single second of his life. He's not an independent thinker, not an independent human being to do what he wants. Something else controls him. What the Egyptians did to Am Israel, as Paro said, what Paro did to the Jews, he made them so busy in slavery to the extent that they will never even realize that they are slaves. A real slave is not someone that is being controlled. A real slave is someone that is being controlled to that degree that he cannot even understand or realize he is a slave. How many of us are looking at an iPhone as a slavery machine? We are slaves to it, 100%. Addicted to the degree that is impossible to understand. We will pay a thousand dollars for a machine. The newest machine comes to the market. So we will be fully controlled. Fully controlled. We think the media has 750 channels on TV because the entertainment world is huge. It's not. They're serving a very, very, very serious purpose. The entire media and the entire technology, not the entire technology, I'm talking about this kind of technology. There are great, great places of technology that are making miracles in the world. I said, I'm not talking about this kind of technology. But the general idea of the media and entertainment world is serving one purpose. I will keep you busy 24-7. So you shall never get forbid think for yourself for a minute. I will never let you think. I will keep you busy. I will give you entertainment. I will make it excited. I will make it colorful. I will make it a tick your heart 24-7. Just get for, I'll make you sleep with your phone. I'll make you wake up with your phone. I'll make you take your phone everywhere you go. Just be in slavery for it. When Am Israel left Egypt, they left slaves to the degree that they didn't even understand that they were slaves. When they came to Yamsuf, when they crossed Yamsuf, and they realized, Bayar Israel. When Am Israel are seeing Zekeli Ve'anveo, when Am Israel realized, when they saw God in Kirat Yamsuf, they started to sing, but not singing because we benefited from it. They were singing, they started to sing out of praising HaKadosh Baruch Hu, not for what it does, but rather for who he is. They saw the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, regardless of their benefits. They saw God and they said, Aha. Miriam HaNevi'ah took it to the next level. Because Miriam Nevi'ah 
was teaching the world that there are in this world two separate kinds of singing. There is a man singing and a woman singing. The Midrash said, She took the drums. Where did she get the drums from? Where did she get the drums from? Who is leaving Egypt with the drums? Like, where, where is that from? The Midrash said that when Am Israel were in Egypt, working hard, being slaves in Egypt, Am Israel were in such pain, they couldn't see anything but pain. The woman and Miriam, with the leadership of Miriam, Miriam said, no, 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 you don't understand. There is God. He'll take us out. We're going to celebrate one day. And they see the woman, with the leadership of Miriam, collecting drums, collecting musical instruments. And they came to Miriam and said, Miriam, what are you doing? What do you mean? What am I? I'm preparing the celebration day. What celebration day? Don't you see what we are going through? Miriam said, I see the pain, but I am able to see the redemption within the pain. While I am suffering, while in darkness, while going through a challenge, I see the freedom. I see God. And I can see him that clear that we can start celebrating now and at least collecting the instruments for the celebration for the big party day. Am Israel crossed Yam Suf and Am Israel sang. Said Miriam, no, this is a man singing. Do you know when a man sing? Men sing after they're satisfied with the miracle, when they're being saved. When they are being saved, when they see the freedom, when they see the geula, when they see the redemption, when they experience that. Vata'an lahim Miriam. Miriam said, let me answer you. Remember you asked me the question? What are you collecting drums for? This is the moment I was collecting this for. This is the moment I'm collecting this for. Said Miriam Nevi'a, a man can sing when he's happy and satisfied after you give him the steak. A woman can sing even from darkness, even from the challenging moment. I just want to conclude this point in a very, very simple way. It is very clear to us to see the greatness of God through seeing the creation. It is very easy if we stop and pay attention to it. If we stop and pay attention and we understand that we are slaves. But if we stop life and start to pay attention, it's easy to see God. Pretty easy. It is easy to sing to God for who He is, regardless of what He does to us. Which is another level of greatness, of singing. What I want to say is that I firmly believe that it's not only true between us and Hashem and God, it's also true between us and each other, as people. Quite often we judge or measure our people for what they do for us. If you're nice to me, you're a good person. If you do something good for me, you're a great person. But I think if we want to live life in a higher position, if we want to live life with a judgmental free, if we want to live life in a true deep connection between people, 
I think it would be a great, great advice for us to go and buy the proper glasses that has the ability to see the greatness of people for who they are, regardless of what they do. Just to look on the person and understand that you're looking at a precious soul, a precious human being, regardless of what they say and what they do to you, regardless of any benefit you get from people. Just having the right glasses and using the skill and the ability to see the greatness of one another and to learn to say to someone and to feel it, to be sincere about it, to say to people, I love you, Jesh, for who you are. I have no agenda, I have no benefit from you, nothing whatsoever. But I appreciate you. I appreciate your greatness. When I see you, I see greatness. I'm going to praise you for who you are. And if we were, I do believe that if we wear those glasses that give us the ability to see the greatness of people, and we're going to start to treat people for what they deserve as great people, we will be able to create the most profound, most powerful family life, community life, nation life, if we only can understand that people are great jewels, people are great polished diamonds, every single one of us. If we start to wear those glasses, we can create the most beautiful and powerful life. It will serve us in a relationship between us and it will serve us in the relationship between us and God. And this is the power of the Shira. This is the power of the Shira. The power of the Shira is to pay attention to what Akadosh Baruch Hu is, not what He does for me. Because anytime the relationship is depending on what you do for me, it will be conditioned and temporarily. As long as you do something for me, I love you. But the moment you're not, you don't exist. And that's what I believe is, is a great lesson we can take for the Shirat Ayam of Am Israel and what differentiates Shirat Ayam from any other Shira that we know. And Be'ezrat Hashem we will have the Zichut to live life in positive eyes that will allow us to see the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and our fellow friends everywhere we go. Thank you very much.